There's a show on Netflix called um, the, the Minimalists. Anybody seen that? Anybody? Anybody. Not one per- The Minimalists? Not one person seen this. Okay. Have you ever heard of the movement called minimalism? Anybody heard of that? Okay. A few of you. All right. So let me explain. There's this movement called minimalism. There are these two guys, they call themselves, they've labeled themselves the millennialists, the the minimalists, and the deal is um, this movement or these people, they've stopped purchasing things and adding to their already cluttered lives and their cluttered homes, and and they've started to get rid of stuff. They're minimalizing. They're decluttering. And what they claim is their lives were so stressful because they had to care for, upkeep, maintain, and clean all of their stuff. Their lives were so stressful because of their stuff, their stuff stopped adding value to their lives and became a source of tension and stress. A couple months ago, my wife got on to these guys, right? Got on to this minimalist movement. She's been listening to all kinds of podcasts on this idea, and a couple of weeks ago, so a a month ago, I watched this hour and a half show, uh, kind of a um, uh, documentary on the minimalists, and how they travel now, and they speak, and they're teaching this new idea on minimalizing, and what it's done for their lives, and Um, So, uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I were on a road trip to Memphis to watch my son's uh, school uh, group and a concert there in Memphis. On the way home, um, we had exhausted the name game, which she always likes to play when we travel, and I hate it. Um, So, I I give up pretty quickly. Uh, We'd exhausted exhausted all of our travel games, and on the way home, she said, Hey, would you want to listen to some, like, TED Talks or some podcasts, some YouTube videos on um, the minimalizing? Being a minimalist. I was like, okay, that's better than the name game, so let's listen up. Um, So we began to, for a few hours, I listened to podcasts and these YouTube videos on minimalism with her. And these minimalists all said this. Getting rid of the clutter, getting rid of all of these things, things that consumed our time and effort. Getting rid of those things that consumed our time and effort what happened is we now are experiencing freedom. They said, uh, they all said we are more free, we're more happy, and the Netflix guys, right, the minimalists said this, and this is their premise for doing what they do and teaching what they teach. They say we are, because we've minimalized, now living more free from the love of stuff and have more time to love people. Now, I'm listening to this. I'm catching their idea. And something happened inside of me, and I, and I shared this with Val while we were driving, and I've shared this with her a couple of the times since. Listening to what they were saying sort of disturbed me, and it sort of excited me. Because here were a bunch of people. Here was a movement of people who were discovering something, like a way of being that seems to be new and it seems to work. And so that's kind of cool, that's kind of exciting. But at the same time, here are a bunch of people, here is a movement of people, none who I ever heard claim to know Jesus, they didn't quote scripture or Bible verses, yet they were onto something that a lot of followers of Jesus reject, neglect, or have no clue about yet should. Shouldn't neglect, yet should have a clue about, should be living it out, right? So this isn't new. And so as I'm listening, I'm thinking, you know what? This, what they're sharing is not new. Like it's not new stuff. What they are discovering is actually something ancient. And it's actually the way life was designed to be lived. Now, how would I know what, um, how life was designed to be lived. How would I know that? How can I claim to know the design of life and how your and my life was meant to be lived? How do I know? What, what, how, what am I talking about? 
Well, listen, this, this morning, this sermon isn't on minimalizing or being a minimalist. I'm not going to ask you to go sell your boat and your golf clubs or that pile of purses and shoes that I know you have in the back of your closet. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to do any of that. That's not what this sermon is about. What I want to talk today about is authority. Now, what do the minimalists and authority have to do with one another? Here's what they have to do. Here, here's how they relate. There is a way the world and humanity w- were intended to work. Like There is design. And some people don't believe this. Some people would argue that the world was a random accident. There is no, no design. And because of that, there's, there is not a way that is best uh, to live for everyone. Like, you, you do you, and I'll do me, and we'll all just do whatever we think is right for me in the moment. And, and because of that, we have billions of people on this planet with differing ideas on what is right and what is wrong. And um, chaos ensues because of that. You watch the news, you see chaos every week, every day on the news. Because everybody has their own idea of what is right and what is wrong. They're living for themselves, and we're all just kind of doing me, you do you, and... But if you believe, though, that the world does have a creator God, then you also have to believe that he designed every detail of it, from the atom to the molecule to the way the human heart and lungs have a rhythm to them to the daily rotation of the earth and the yearly revolving around the sun. Like, those things demonstrate design and order. So God designed the way the world works. Whenever we have a scientific discovery, I believe science points to order, points to a creator. Whenever we have a scientific discovery, all that is is humanity discovering the way God designed things to work. We just hadn't we didn't know it at the time and when we make a discovery it's just it points to design. God designed the way the world works. We're just uncovering the way God made things to work when we prove it. So, and not just on a scientific level. God didn't just design um, this earth on a, and, and maintains order on a scientific level. On a relational level and spiritual level, too, God made things to work in a certain way. All of this life is meant to work in a certain way by the Creator God. A way to live where humanity is at its best. Because of that... When God speaks, or when God directs humanity, it is for humanity's best. Like, it's for our own good. Because God loves us, He speaks. And when He speaks, when He does, um, we, should, we should listen. Because who knows His creation and how things work better than Him? Colossians 1, 15-17 says this about Jesus and and, and his relationship with God and their creation. It says, The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, things visible, things invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him, and for him. In other words, he owns it all, and it's all meant to be returned to him. He is before all things, and listen to this, and in him all things hold together. So here's the deal. Here's what this passage is saying. No one has authority over God or his son, Jesus Christ. The, they, they created all things. They have power over all things. They answer to no one what they are what holds they are what hold all things together like why does the earth never veer off course and crash into venus or mars because god holds its course why does your heart beat without your help 60 to 70 times a minute because god is your pacemaker all right god has authority over it all he designed it he knows how it is to work best he holds it all together now keep that in mind have you ever heard of free will when god created you when god created humanity he gave humanity free will in other words 
Um, he chose in his design of you and me to allow us to think for ourselves and to choose for ourselves. Last month, I gave my son free will. Uh, he finally got rid of his driver's permit and, and got his license. And I gave him the free will to, you, can, you got your license now, you can drive, you can go uh, whenever you want, kind of wherever you want, right? Now, that's a scary thing to let your 16, 17-year-old go on their own in their car. That's a scary thing. Now, be honest. It's not as scary as riding with him while he's learning to drive. I, you know, just, just kind of keeping it real. I'm, I'm kind of I'm glad he got his license just so I don't have to ride with him. But I gave him permission. I gave him free will to think for himself. And so he's in his car by himself. It's up to him whether or not he follows the instructions and wears the seatbelt and uses his turn signal and stays under the speed limit or drives the speed limit or drives five miles an hour over the speed limit, whatever it is, right? So he has free, I've given him license or I've given him free will. In the same way, God has authority over it all, but he's given us the freedom to think and choose. Now, because he has authority over it all, because you and I as humanity have Um, permission to think and choose for ourselves, this is the question you and I and all of humanity have to ask ourselves and have to answer. Who or what will have the final authority in your life? Who or what will have the final authority in your life? That's a big question. It's actually the fundamental question that stands above all other questions in this life. Who or what will have final authority in your life? The answer to that question will determine what you value in this life. It will determine how you handle crisis, pain, and trouble. It will determine how you handle loss. It will determine how you work. It will determine how you parent or how you handle your marriage. It will determine how you handle your money, how you will spend and how you will save. It will determine what you chase after. It will determine what you put your hope in or what you hope for. Ultimately, it will determine whether or not you will find joy, peace, hope, and freedom in this life, who or what will have the final authority in your life? You have to wrestle with that question and answer that question. For most people, we don't necessarily sit down and go um, or, or say and decide, this will be my ultimate authority in this life. We, we don't normally sit down and most people don't normally sit down and make that claim or make that decision. It usually doesn't happen like that. Now, we will intentionally choose and say who won't be our authority. You know what I mean? Like when I turned 17 or 18, if you were to ask me, hey, who's going to be the ultimate authority in your life? I would go, I don't know who will, but I will tell you who won't. Um, it won't be my parents, I can tell you that. When I turn 18, bro, I'm out of here. Like, they are, their rules and their curfews, they will not be my ultimate authority, right? Teachers, professors, when I graduate, they will not be my ultimate authority. I don't answer to them anymore. I'm going to prank them after I graduate. I mean, toilet paper and trees, right? The police... The police will not be my ultimate authority. I got my license now. I'm going to drive as fast as I want, go wherever I want. I'm independent. Now listen, um, when you're 18 and independent and nobody's your authority, but you're sitting in driving school because you have no points on your driver's license because you've gotten three tickets, (laughs) that'll settle a kid down and make them think through who their authority is going to be. Yeah, driver's school twice. Or... When you're, when you're in college and out of money, and, you, and, you gotta, and you're 19 years old and you've got to call your mom and dad for lunch money from college, right? That, that's humbling. So in some ways, we rebel and we will identify who won't be our authority, but most people don't intentionally choose who will be their authority. For most people, it just kind of happens. We just kind of drift under an authority. Like we watch someone uh, parent their kids, and and so we just model it. Or if we don't see a a set of good parents parenting their kids, we just kind of do what we saw our parents do for us, good or bad. We don't know any other way. We just model model the way our parents parented us. Marriage, same way. Handling money, 
handling money, we just kind of, how's everybody else doing it? We just see what others are doing, what others are buying, and we get after it. And we think, oh, well, oh, you have $15,000 worth of credit card debt? Well, you still seem like you're doing pretty good. And you go home and go, honey, they're in debt. Crank up the credit card limits. Let's go buy some stuff. Like, they're doing pretty good. Maybe we can too. So we just kind of, we, we, we don't intentionally choose our authority. We just kind of drift under what we see or what we think is working. So when it comes to the question, or when it comes to our ultimate authority, um, if you were to choose, it really kind of comes down to three options. It comes down to three choices, who your authority is going to be. And for most people, the first option is myself. When it comes to my ultimate authority in this life, I choose me. Who knows me better than me, right? I, and in order to do that, I fully trust in me, I'm going to fully rely on me, and we love this, especially when life for us is good, and it seems we're making all the right choices, and all the right moves, and it's all working out. Like, we love it when it works out for us, because it makes us feel powerful, it makes us feel in control. And relying on me means that um, I just have to kind of uh, rely on my gut feeling in any given circumstance or any given instance. I just kind of rely on my gut to tell me what to do in any given moment. There's a problem with that, though. There's a problem with that. Study after study reveals that our perceptions in this world, the way we view the world at times in any given circumstance, are more likely to be wrong than right. Right? So the way I'm viewing a circumstance or the assumptions I'm making about what's happening around me usually are wrong in some way. In fact, sometimes we even lie to ourselves. The Bible says this about the heart. Because we, we hear people say, and we, we, maybe you've even been kind of coached by someone, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Here's what the Bible says about the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Well, I'd make a great Hallmark card, wouldn't it? Like, <laughs> well, thanks a lot, you know? Like, and, and so, but, but you, can, you could, if you wanted to, that, that's one of your choices, is you could rely on you. And the question is, are you, are you, do you know everything that's going on and every decision you ought to make is... It, do you have it all together? Do you trust yourself? The second option or the second choice is this, the world. If we don't trust ourselves, then, then maybe what we do is we trust uh, popular opinion. Like we can depend on what other people think to determine our values and decisions. And we love this too. We, I think, I think. When I begin to have problems with myself or I can't figure out a problem on my own, what I can do then is I can turn to a podcast or a local YouTube expert. And, and, and that's, that's, that's not a big deal if you're working on a house project or a Pinterest craft. But it's not the same when it comes to overcoming something in your life, right? You turn to somebody on YouTube or a podcast, whatever, everybody's got a different opinion. Everybody's got a different solution. And, you know, what's going on with your life? Well, maybe you should eat better or exercise or meditate or get away for a week or think good thoughts. Or maybe you just need to quit your job. Maybe you need to man up. Maybe you need to be a strong woman, right? None of those things are bad. None of those things are wrong. But... The problem with that, the problem with trusting the world and popular opinion is this. The world often values the wrong things. For instance, the world emphasizes beauty over character. The world tells us to pursue whatever feels good. Is that good advice? If that was good advice, you would never parent your child because they're always trying to do whatever feels good. You know what I mean? Is that ever good? Is that always good for them? The world declares whoever has the most possessions wins. Like the world doesn't always value the right things. And, and we're bombarded with these ideas and values through all sorts, through all the media actually. So much so that it's easy to start thinking that you and I were put on this planet to feel good, look good, and get as much stuff as possible. And is that what life is all about? And what happens when you can't? 
What happens when you don't feel good and you just can't get there to that place where you do feel good? What happens when you can't afford all those things that you think you need to get? What happens when you get old and can't look 21 anymore? Like, what happens? Is the world where we ought to place our trust? Should the world be our primary authority in this life? Here's the third option. The third option is God's Word. And here's what I want to consider. Here's what I want us all to consider. If this world has a designer, has a creator, and he is good, it makes sense that when he speaks, it's because he loves you, and he wants you to know him. And he wants to let you in on his ways, his design for the way the world was really intended to work and how you were really intended to work because he wants you to live your best life. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Bible says about itself that it is the inspire, inspired word of God. God is speaking to you, and God is speaking to me through his word, through the Bible. He wants you and I to know him. He wants you and I to know the good news of his son, Jesus Christ. He wants, us, he wants you and I to know his way, his ways. Right? The Bible says that Jesus is the only way. It, the, the Bible is full of truth. It's objective. It's truthful in every way, as opposed to our own perceptions or as opposed to the world's opinions. Like The Bible is not a book of myths. It's not fantasy. It's not outdated rules. Jesus says in God's Word, about God's Word, he says John, in John 8, verses 31 through 32, he says, If you hold to my teachings... Jesus says, if you hold to what I teach, like my ways, you are really my disciples. And then he says, and you will know the truth. And here's the deal with the truth. The truth, the reality of how things are, the reality of how God made you and how you are to relate in this world, the truth will set you free. Set you free from what? Set you free from what? I believe it will set you free from foolishness, right? Truth sets you free from being fooled, from being lied to, from being manipulated. It sets you free from believing in a lie. It sets you free from believing in a lie, living out that lie, and making life worse, making things worse, hurting yourself worse, hurting others, creating pain for yourself. Wait, it sets you free from wasting your life, chasing after something that in the end can't, can't provide, can't come through, can't satisfy. Ultimately, it sets you free, the truth sets you free from holding on to this world as your hope. Because listen, this world, nothing in this world is your answer. You ever feel worn out by this world? I'm, I'm just talking about tied down and strangled. Like, you ever feel that way? I, I do. I mean, life is tough. Li life, is, life is at times painful. And we all know that. We've all experienced it. Some of us every day, some of you are there right now. Like, life, just, you just feel blah, like d depression and anxiety and worry and fear. And some of us are strangled by those things every day. And many times it's because we've placed our hope, we're looking for answers in the wrong things. And when they don't come through, our worry, our concern, our anxiety, our, 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 it, it just increases our stress, chasing after the wrong things. A lot of our troubles occur because we base our choices on unreliable authorities. We base our uh, our choices on culture, like everybody's doing it, I should too. Or we base our choices on tradition, well, we've always done it that way. We base our choices on reason, well, it seemed logical. Or we base our choices on emotion, I just felt, it just felt right. Yet, what we need, what you and I need as we navigate through this life is we need a perfect standard that will never lead us in the wrong direction. And only God's word 
meets us in that need. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is flawless. Like it sets you free. It gives you the truth so that you can be set free. It is capable of setting you free from a lot of the pain and problems that we tend to create for ourselves. If we'll trust God's word, abide in God's word, and obey God's word. So it will set you free from those things. Now, what will it set you free for? What's it set you free for? Here's what truth, here's what the truth of Jesus, the Word of God, sets us free for. To live life in the best possible way. Like To set you free to live without the worry or fear that you have to do it all, fix it all, have it all together, and be it all. Like Jesus sets you free because he is the one who does those things. He is, the, he is all you need. Scripture says, Jesus says, let me set you free. Let me have you. Let me be your authority. I'm a good boss. I'm the perfect authority. I'm a gentle, loving leader. I'm a good father. I am the best. Like under my authority, you living out my words in Scripture, you living out my words in the Bible, I'm the kind of authority that offers you freedom, that offers you peace, that offers you hope, that offers you joy, that offers you life. It's me. Follow me. Abide by me and my words and my way, and you will be set free. Depend on me. Let me come through for you. Trust me. Abide by my wise and expert advice in the Bible while journeying through this world. Right? Scripture says the Word of God introduces us to God, and it introduces us to Jesus. It's through the Word of God that you and I I get to know Jesus, and in Scripture it says that if we follow Jesus, live for Jesus, surrender to Jesus, we will find life. John 10.10 10 says, Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, but I have come that they may have life, and not just any kind of life, and not a life later in heaven but life right here, right now, to the full, like abundant life now. One of the reasons we started this church is because we experienced freedom, hope, joy, and life in Jesus Christ, and we wanted others to know what we've been experiencing. We're experiencing this through Jesus and by abiding by his words and his ways, and we want you to experience what we're experiencing. Like, we understand frustration with life and sometimes the insanity of this life. And at some point, we got tired of trying and we got exhausted trying every self help option. We exhausted every other authority, we exhausted every other opinion. Everything we ended up trying left us in the same state empty, hurting, and still searching. And the more you end up in that place, empty, hurting, and still searching, the only thing you have left to do if you don't meet Jesus is escape, abandon your relationships, medicate, and that only makes things worse. But one day we met Jesus. Jesus changed everything. Jesus helped us make sense of this life. Jesus helped helped us navigate through this life in a more healthy, sturdy way. Jesus didn't change our circumstances. He didn't necessarily make our circumstances better. But with him, we have a new authority, we have a better leader, and we operate better in dire circumstances. Like once we met Jesus and made him our leader authority, we began to build our lives on him by building our lives on the Father's word, the word of God, the Bible. The Bible is the foremost authority on this life, and honestly, it is the foremost authority on your life, whether you believe that or not. So as followers of Jesus, we make the Word of God the first word and the last word in our lives. Like, if you want the best life possible while on this earth, build your lives on the Bible. 
live the way life was intended to be lived by the creator and the designer of this universe. In order to build your life on the Bible, listen to this, it must become the authoritative standard for your life. It must become the compass in which you rely for direction, the counsel you listen to for making wise decisions, the benchmark you use for evaluating everything. The Bible must always have the first word and the last word in your life. Like the most important decision you can make today is to settle this issue of who or what will be the ultimate authority in your life. Decide that regardless of culture, tradition, reason, or emotion, you choose the Bible as your final authority. When making decisions, you determine first to ask, what does the Bible say? Before I make, the deci- before I make this decision, how does God direct me in this decision? Resolve that when God says to do something, you will trust God's word and do it whether or not it makes sense or you feel like doing it. Let me, let, me, let me come back to the minimalists for a second. Let me close by coming back to the minimalists. How do I know our design and the best plan for our lives while here on this earth? How do I know that the minimalists are onto something whether they know it or not? The minimalists may not know it, but they are learning and they are teaching God's way, the way life was meant to live from the beginning. How do I know that? Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then down in verses 24 through 26, the scriptures say, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In other words, you can only have one ultimate authority in your life. And he goes on to say, if you make me your authority, there is no reason to worry or to be stressed. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow. They do not reap. They do not store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? How do I know the minimalists are onto something that is ancient and is the way God designed it? Because the ancient scriptures share with us God's plan, direct us in God's ways. Offer us the best life possible if we follow Jesus Christ and abide in his word. You're worth it. You're worth it. That's why God gives us his word.